Call the Secretary of State for Defence, Mr Gavin Williamson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Half a century ago, HMS Resolution glided into the Clyde and sailed into the history books. This was the start of our longest sustained military operation, Operation Relentless, and the beginning of our continuous at-sea deterrence. Since then, there has always been a Royal Navy ballistic missile submarine at sea protecting our nation. And thousands of submariners have followed in the wake of Resolution's crew, conducting vital work, unseen and undetected, every minute of every day. Today, it is for this House to pay tribute to those brave men and women, past and present, who have helped make this operation so successful. We already honour our submariners with a deterrent patrol pin, often known as the bomber pin, giving recognition to their enormous efforts. But we also recognise that we want to go further still. Consequently, we are going to ensure that those who complete ten patrols will now be recognised with a new silver bomber pin. Future bomber pins will be made from metal taken from HMS Resolution, linking today's submariners with the forefathers and emphasising the longevity and the significance of the 50-year mission. Of course. Thank the Defence Secretary for, for giving way and congratulating him on bringing such an important debate to uh, the House at this time. Does he recognise that there is a case for going even further and, uh, and giving, making all of those who have served on Bomber Patrol eligible for a service medal, given the extraordinary nature of, uh, uh, of what they have contributed to? I think the Honourable Gentleman raises an important point, and it's certainly something that I'd be willing to look at. I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman is aware that it's not, a, sadly, a decision purely for the Ministry of Defence, uh, but we'd certainly be happy to look at the merits of this and how we give full recognition for all those crews that have served over such a long period of time. Um, of course. Secretary of State for giving way and for his welcome and announcement and also his response to the uh, model of friend, the member for Barrow. Could I just make, and this isn't cavilling at it, could he try and ensure that these medals are made in the UK, please? <laughs> I'd be very disappointed if they weren't to be made in the United Kingdom. And uh, I can assure, uh, my understanding is that the uh, bomber pins are manufactured uh, here in the United Kingdom. But... Uh, um, even as we pay tribute to the Submariners, it's equally important that we think of their families too. Those who often have to go for months on end without hearing from their loved ones. And we must also pay tribute to the thousands of industry experts who have played a vital role in this national endeavour. Of course. Grateful to him for giving way, but I wonder how he thinks we can possibly lecture other countries about not seeking to acquire nuclear weapons. What moral high ground do we have to do that if we ourselves not only possess them but are upgrading them? Does he really think the world would be a safer place if every country had nuclear weapons? And if that's not the case, how on earth do we justify it if we're doing it? I, I firmly believe that the world is a safer place by us having a nuclear yeah. deterrent and in the responsible way that it is deployed. And uh, I think that the Honourable Lady and myself will always probably find area to disagree on this. Um, I will come on to the issue of deterrence later on, and if I can just make some more progress, because I think it would be remiss of me not to mention the town of Barrow in Finesse, yeah. and our thanks to the people of Barrow who have crafted these giants of the deep and continue to do so, ensuring we have the right technology and the right uh, vessels in order to be able to deliver our nuclear deterrent. I will give way to my honourable friend. 
May I uh, thank the Secretary of State for the way he is introducing this debate and in response to the question about uh, other countries possessing nuclear weapons or not, it takes me back to the old arguments where we used to actually ask people to name a single other country that would either acquire nuclear weapons because we've got them or get rid of them because we decided unilaterally to get rid of ours. And do you know what? They never came up with another name for another country. I, I, I will, I, I'm not sure if uh, my, uh, the Honourable Gentleman for Coventry is going to mention such a country but I'll certainly give way to him. <laughs> Mention uh, such a country. What I'm going to ask him is really about the welfare of the ex-mariners and how they are looked after, particularly those that are covered by, the, for example, the covenant that a Labour government introduced. Well, I, I think we can be duly proud on this side of the House of the work that's been done since 2010 in terms of ensuring that those who are veterans of all three services are properly looked after and yeah. submariners are as equally covered in that. But if I can take the opportunity to make just a little bit of progress and then I will give way. Um, it's important to understand the remarkable engineering that goes into these remarkably sophisticated submarines, uh, a level of sophistication that matches a spacecraft. And it's only fitting in this debate, it marks the start of a series of events designed to commemorate such dedicated and continuous service. And this isn't just in terms of the submariners, but also industry and the communities that have supported that. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman giving way. And uh, as, uh, as a son of a Samariner myself, I know how important it is that we uh, uh, thank those people who served on submarines. But as the MP for Devonport, uh, will the Secretary of State also agree with me that we should spare, pay a special thanks to all those people in Devonport who have over many decades refitted and ensured that our nuclear submarines are operational so they can continue, the, uh, continue at sea deterrent? Because without the work of those specialist skills and engineers, we wouldn't have uh, Cassidy today. I think, if I recall correctly, there's a thousand people who are dependent in terms of their jobs and livelihoods in Plymouth uh, on uh, supporting our nuclear submarines. And it is, uh, I'd very much like to add my thanks to the work that they do. But it also goes to demonstrate the important benefit that our nuclear deterrent provides for the whole country in terms of jobs and in terms of skills. I'll give way to my right honourable friend. I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend. In, in this geographic tour of, uh, of areas that support this uh, at sea deterrent, I'm sure he was coming on to talk about. Aldermaston, the part of West Berkshire that I represent, and the surrounding area where thousands of people uh, work in this centre of excellence which, for science and for engineering, the benefits of which go out into the economy, into other areas, nothing to do with the nuclear deterrent, and have been a huge benefit to this country. This is absolutely right that my right honourable friend mentions Aldermaston and the work that they do in terms of the continued. Uh, uh, the continued ability to develop our nuclear deterrent and make sure that we remain ahead of the game. But this has an enormous benefit to the whole wider economy in terms of the encouragement of skills and the development of skills that this investment is making in terms of science and technology and keeping us ahead of the game and ahead of our rivals. I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I thank the Secretary of State for giving way. Um, he makes a very important point of the industrial contribution that our shipbuilding industry makes and it is having worked for the company that builds our nation's submarines and, and naval ships. I'm all too, well, too, well too aware of the, how important that impact is. But a critical thing is the way in which these ships are financed and submarines are financed. And in fact, they're uh, dependent on in year financing, and that really disrupts the ability to build the infrastructure that's going to serve these ships through their life cycle. So how are we going to change the way that ships are financed by the Treasury, ensure that we're actually giving them proper project financing so that the companies can build the infrastructure that's world-class to build these submarines and ships for the future? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his intervention. I'll deal with this and then I'll probably make some progress because I know there's a lot of interest in the House and many members want to have the opportunity to speak. Uh, he raises an important point and that's why the Government has set aside £31 billion to deliver 
uh, the dreadnought programme and ensure we have a continuous at sea nuclear deterrence. Uh, that's why we've also built into a contingency in terms of that, because we're very conscious that we want to give the security and the confidence that this is a programme that will deliver in budget and on time. Now, if I can make some progress, it is important that we look and pay our thanks to those who have served on those submarines, for families as well as the whole industry. And next month there will be the Westminster Abbey service recognising the commitment of our submariners. In July there will be a parade at Her Majesty's naval base Clyde. And at the end of November there will be a special memorial commemoration at Edinburgh Castle. However, Today's debate is important because it also gives us the opportunity to underline why the deterrent still matters so much to the United Kingdom, why it remains very much at the heart of our national security policy, and why it has been one of the rare areas to command popular support across both sides of the House. And I think it's an important point to make that this is something that has been supported by both Conservative governments and Labour governments continuously over the last few decades, and I certainly hope for many decades into the future. The doubters who persist in believing that the deterrent is simply a Cold War relic need to be reminded of three salient points. First and foremost, the nuclear dangers have not gone away. On the contrary, the geopolitical situation is more unstable than ever before. We are facing challenges that are growing in scale, complexity and also diversity. Russia is rebuilding its nuclear arsenal. It has breached the INF Treaty and in Europe has now deployed new nuclear-capable missile systems to target and threaten the West. Not only this... But it continues to develop and adapt its doctrine to give primacy to nuclear weapons. North Korea is the only state to have detonated a nuclear weapon in the 21st century. Despite positive dialogue, its weapons remain intact. We hope that North Korea will return to compliance with its obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. But the point is that both nations have shown their willingness to rattle the nuclear sabre in the past. There are no indications that these dangers will disappear any time soon, so we cannot relax our guard. While there is risk to other states developing weapons, we must have a credible response to that threat. And our independent nuclear deterrent Our posture in terms of our nuclear weapons gives us defences against such actions. It is our ultimate insurance policy. It protects us every day from the most extreme threats to our national security and our way of life. Beyond that, it gives future generations greater strategic options. The power to protect themselves into the 2060s and beyond whatever may lie around the corner. Next, as last year's NATO summit in Brussels recognised, the UK's nuclear deterrent provides a critical contribution to our alliance. Since 1962, the UK has assigned all our nuclear forces to NATO's defence, a 50-year commitment of a defence and security of every single member of that great alliance. A commitment as strong today as it has ever been in the past. All member states benefit from this capability, which gives the alliance another centre of decision-making to complicate the calculations of our adversaries. In fact, Many allies signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty in the late 1960s, safe in the knowledge that they would be covered by that nuclear umbrella that the United Kingdom provides for them. Those who argue we should disarm should consider whether such a move would actually make nuclear proliferation more rather than less likely. Nor... Could we blame others, such as the United States, 
for questioning why they should be paying the price for protecting us from nuclear threats. Of course. Um, In my constituency, we are the home of GCHQ, which, of course, has unprecedented and unparalleled security cooperation and intelligence sharing with the United States. Does he agree with me that it's the UK's commitment to the continuous at sea nuclear deterrent that is one of the foundation stones of that strong relationship which keeps our people safe? Uh, It is a point that I will touch on later, but my honourable friend raises an important point of Our nuclear deterrent is a cornerstone of that relationship. It's a long, enduring relationship. It's a depth of relationship that the United States does not share with a single other country anywhere on this earth. And it's that close collaboration that makes us safer as well as our allies safer as well. If I can make some progress, I'm sure the Honourable Member will appreciate. Indeed... The extent to which our deterrent underpins our special relationship with the United States cannot ever be underplayed. So we should be proud of the fact that we are one of a few nations with both strategic nuclear and conventional carrier capabilities. Proud that those strengths give the United Kingdom influence not just within NATO but across the world giving us the capability to influence events in our interests, standing up for our values, standing up for the United Kingdom. My third point is that there are simply no credible alternatives to the submarine-based deterrent. Some claim there are cheaper and more effective ways of providing a similar effect to the Trident system. But we have been down this road many times before, Successive studies by both Labour and Conservative administrations have shown simply there are no other alternatives. Most recently, the Trident Alternatives Review of 2013 found submarines were less vulnerable to attack than silos or aircraft and can maintain a continuous posture in a way that aircraft and land-based alternatives cannot. While their missiles had greater range and capability than other alternative delivery systems, overall it concluded a minimum, credible, assured and independent deterrent requires nuclear submarines with ballistic missiles. I'll give way to the Right Honourable Gentleman. And he's making a very compelling argument for, for this. But does he not therefore regret the dithering and delay that took place in the renewal of the submarine programme when they were in coalition at the behest of the Liberal Democrats who don't even seem to have bothered to turn up today. We could spend a long time debating the Liberal Democrats, but it would probably be a waste of time. Um, So... uh, What I am exceptionally proud of the fact is that this government has been the government that has committed to a nuclear deterrent and the fact in 2016 so many colleagues from both sides of the House united in one lobby in making sure that we delivered it. I see that we have a very excitable member from the SNP who is keen to make a point. And uh, we weren't in that lobby, uh, funnily enough. Um, I struggle to see the logic in arguing for multilateral disarmament when simultaneously unilaterally rearming. Uh, but my question to the Secretary of State is this. How many nuclear submarines have been decommissioned since 1980 successfully? The answer is none, isn't it? So what we are intending to do over the coming uh, year is to see the first decommissioning of uh, submarines. This is an important issue that does need to be addressed. And I know it's something that uh, my honourable friend, the member for Berwick-upon-Tweed and the honourable member for Plymouth-Devonport have been looking at and made some very important contributions to. It's also an issue that the Ministry of Defence uh, takes very seriously. And I was hoping hoping, and this was obviously very naive of me, that the Honourable Gentleman was going to talk about the pride that Scotland has for being the home of our submarine forces going in the future. Talk about the fact that the real economic benefit that our continuous at-sea nuclear deterrence delivers Scotland. The fact that we are actually already got 6,800 people employed at Her Majesty's Naval by Eat Base Clyde, 
and the fact that that's going to be increasing to 8,500. It's disappointing that you couldn't talk with a little bit of a pride about the service personnel who contribute so much. This is about saying thank you to those submariners who have continuously put their lives at risk, continuously done so much for our nation, keeping us safe. And I would hope that all members in this House, regardless of their view about a continuous at sea nuclear deterrent, can have the courtesy of paying tribute to those brave men and women. Mr. Speaker, we cannot wish away the rise of the atomic bomb, especially with some 14,500 nuclear weapons on this earth. But that isn't to say that we have given up our determination to create a nuclear free world. On the contrary, we have been at the forefront of arms reduction. Since the height of the Cold War, the United Kingdom has reduced our forces by more than 50%. We have delivered on our commitment to reduce the number of warheads carried by our vanguard submarines from 48 to 40. And we have decreased the number of operationally available warheads to no more than 120. I have given the Honourable Lady the opportunity to speak. Um, We remain committed to reducing our stockpile to no more than 180 warheads by the mid-2020s. But the reality is that other nations have not taken the hint from the lead that the United Kingdom has shown. Even as we have cut back, others have been creating new systems to get around treaty obligations or quite simply ignoring the commitments that they have already made. I have already spoken about Russia's breach of the INF Treaty. The truth is the only way to create global security conditions necessary for nuclear disarmament is by working multilaterally. So our commitment to the deterrent is cast iron. We're spending around £4 billion every year to ensure the ultimate guarantee of our safety for the next 50 years, not least by investing in the next generation ballistic missile submarines, the Dreadnought class. We've made significant progress. We've already named three of these state-of-the-art submarines, Dreadnought, Valiant, Warspite. Construction has already started in Barrow on HMS Dreadnought. These names recall some of the greatest ships of our naval history. We're investing millions in the -the state-of-the-art facilities and complex nuclear propulsion systems, and we're ensuring every day counts by utilising our dreadnought contingency with access up to a billion pounds to fund more in the early years to drive out cost and risk later in the programme. I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. He speaks of getting around obligations. Could he clarify why the MOD stopped publishing the official safety ratings report from Trident's watchdog, the Defence Nuclear Safety Regulator, for, I think, the last two years. Are they trying to cover up the rise in safety incidents instead of taking proper action to fix them now? Um, At the very heart of everything that we do at the Ministry of Defence and through all three of our services and with our industrial partners, safety is at the core of what we do. And that is very much the but very much for focus that we will always have going into the future. And I'll give way to the honourable gentleman. Thank the Defence Secretary for giving away again. He's been very generous uh, with his time. And doesn't the incident in uh, Barrow today just underline that actually the shipwrights who are involved in constructing the, uh, the Royal Navy submarines in Barrow and across the country are themselves performing a vital service for the nation, which is not always without risk. This is a national endeavour, and we often talk quite rightly about those who are serving in the Royal Navy, but it is not just the Royal Navy that is supporting it, it is the other two services, it is the fact that the Royal Air Force, through the P8s, 
uh, Poseidon submarine hunting aircraft, the surface fleet of the Royal Navy, all making sure that our deterrence is safe. And of course, those workers in Barrow who are constructing some of the world's finest submarines that will take to the seas, and our gratitude is deep. And we mustn't forget the 30,000 jobs that are dependent on this. The fact that we are investing in new technology, the fact that we are investing in new capabilities, are bringing prosperity right across the country. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. He has been very generous with his time. He he recognises the investment that is going into the shipyard at Barrow, which is fantastic for the the town of Barrow. Over £300 million capital investment in that shipyard. So, if that was good enough for the uh, Trident Renewal Programme, why wasn't it good enough for the Type 26 programme in the Clyde, where there has been not the equivalent level of (laughs) capital investment in shipyard infrastructure? Uh, Quite simply, the BAE Systems had decided that uh, that level of investment in the Govan shipyard wasn't required. But what we are pleased to do, uh, what we are pleased to do, is the fact that we're making a multi-year investment in Type 26s. This provides an order book uh, for the Govan shipyard going into the 2030s, and uh, it's something that I think most shipyards would uh, look at very enviously. The investments that we've made, the decisions that we have taken in terms of bringing extra investment in terms of dreadnought, means that these new submarines will be delivered on time. To guarantee this delivery, we've modernised our entire nuclear enterprise. We've established the Defence Nuclear Organisation to manage our portfolio of nuclear programmes. We've created the Submarine Delivery Agency, who, with our industry partners, have made real progress on the ground in building our future submarines and ensuring that our current boats are able to fulfil their missions. And we've established the new Dreadnought Alliance, which, through a coalition with the Royal Navy, the Ministry of Defence, BAE Systems and Rolls-Royce, combines the skills of uh, large players within industry with the talents of the public sector to deliver the best for defence and the best for our nation. Meanwhile, we are continuing to refine the options and technical solutions which will inform our decisions on replacing the warhead. Next year, over half a century on since HMS Resolution's historic voyage, Her Majesty's naval base Clyde will become the home of all of our (coughs) submarines. One of the largest employment sites in Scotland, this base provides for the livelihoods of around 6,800 military and civilians and brings significant wider benefits to the local economy and to the whole of Scotland. It's a salutary reminder not just to the enormous role that Scotland plays as the home of our deterrent, but in protecting the United Kingdom and, of course, our NATO allies. But of its role in sustaining hundreds of businesses as well as thousands of jobs across the length and breadth of our union. Head over to the Barrow and Furnish shipyard and you'll get a sense of the sheer scale of the enterprise. The construction hall alone where Dreadnought is being built is the size of 21 Olympic swimming pools. But the deterrent doesn't just provide jobs. It is helping train thousands of apprentices in engineering, design, software development, naval architecture and combat systems. Many of those apprentices are following in the footsteps not just of their parents but also of their grandparents. Yet they are learning the sorts of advanced manufacturing techniques that will keep their descendants and Britain at the cutting edge of technology for years and generations to come. We are... Of course, that would be. I'm for the Secretary of State giving way, and I think he's making a very important point about the importance of skills. Uh, we learnt the lessons or, or the costs that were involved when we stopped sub- submarine uh, building in the 1990s and the uh, knock-on effects that on, added on, for example, a stoop. Can he give an assurance or could he emphasise to his officials the importance of not only those skills now but ensuring that there's continuation of work after Red Nought to ensure that we don't get the gap we had before? Yeah. Yeah. I hear the Honourable Member for Barrow shouting to get on with this. I think, I think we're building a lot more submarines in Barrow than the last Labour government ever did. So um, I, I, was, 
I was hoping he would shout out thank you. Um, um, I, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, underline the important point that the Honourable Member did make, because it is about investing in those skills continuously, and I think Barrow has one of the healthiest order books uh, that it has seen for a long time, and the sense that there is a whole generation, not just of astute, but the dreadnought class submarine, and it's important on that future generation, and that's why we're looking at how we're best to take advantage of how we conduct warfare subsurface subsurface at the moment, making sure that we'll be investing in the right type of technology in order to keep a competitive advantage over our opponents, but also keeping the skills here in the United Kingdom. I sense the Right Honourable Gentleman wishes to come back. Everything what the uh, Secretary of State has just said, but particularly, for example, in uh, naval design, a lot of that work is being carried out now in the early stages of the dreadnought. It will come to an end quite quickly. It's important that we, act, we have our follow-on work uh, for those uh, uh, designers. Otherwise, we do get a gap. Yeah. Uh, and if we have that gap, those people will be uh, employed in other industries in the nuclear yeah, sector, uh, which will, when we come to actually generate the next generation of uh, submarines, they'll not be there. Yeah. Well, we saw that difficult problem occur when we saw such a sustained gap in Barrett where there hadn't been the work that was undertaken on submarines over a period of, I think it was almost 10 years. So we're very aware of that, and that's why we're currently doing a study as to how we uh, develop the next generation. Because if the investment, let's say, in the Dreadnought programme were to come to the end, uh, the skills that we are seeing developed, not just in Barrow, but whether it is uh, uh, in Derby with Rolls-Royce, but so many other hundreds of businesses right across the country, we would quite simply lose those skills. We would lose that national capability. That's why we are doing exactly as the Right Honourable Member uh, is suggesting, because those skills are almost impossible to replace. And we recognise that the investment in the deterrence is an investment in our future in more ways than one. 1969 will always be remembered as an iconic year. It was the year an astronaut first set foot on the moon. But from a UK perspective, an event far less heralded has proved to be far more enduring. For the unsung heroes who began their undersea vigil that year have guaranteed our peace and prosperity for the last five decades. Our nuclear deterrence posture is only possible thanks to their commitment. Out of sight they may be, but they are never out of mind. And while we can never fully repay them for what they have given our nation, in a more uncertain world... We are making sure that they will have the means to perform their outstanding and vital service to our nation, safeguarding our way of life relentlessly for another 50 years. The question is that this House has considered the 50th anniversary of the continuous at-sea deterrent.